Welcome back to Rock the JVM, folks. I'm Daniel, and in this video, we're going to discuss extension methods in Scala 3. So the goal of this video is to learn how we can attach new methods to existing types whose source code we don't really have access to. Maybe those are in a library or they're part of the Scala standard library and so on and so forth. Also, we're going to discuss the relationship between this mechanism and the old Scala 2 implicits mechanism. And for that, we will need to know how implicits work and how given and using clauses work in Scala 3. And for this, we already have a bunch of videos here on the Rock the JVM channel discussing how we can use given and using clauses and how how they compare to the old implicits mechanism. Now, as always, I code from scratch, so I highly recommend that you follow me or write code with me, and whenever you need to refresh your memory about these concepts, just refer back to this video or to the written form at the blog with the link in the description. So if you haven't done so already, click the like button for me and subscribe to the channel, and let's go to the code. So here I have a Scala 3 project with Scala 3 RC2, which is probably the last release candidate before the official release of Scala 3. So the code that I'm gonna write is most likely going to compile in Scala 3 without any problems. So in Scala 2, the previous version, we had this concept of adding methods to types that were already defined elsewhere and which we couldn't really modify, for example, like string or int or some types defined in external libraries which you could not modify. So this technique was called type enrichment, which was pretty boring, so people came up with the more colloquial term pimping which is pretty slangish, and this was also abandoned for the more commonly used term extension methods, because that's what we're essentially doing. So in Scala 2, we can add extension methods to existing types via implicit classes. So let's say we have a class. I'm going to define a case class. I'm going to call this person, and this takes a name as a string. Now, this person has a method that I'm going to call greet. This returns a string, and this says, hi, my name is name, and um, uh, how are you, for example. And I need to put an S here, so my name is name, uh, nice to meet you. Okay, so we have a small class with a small method here. So in this case, then the following implicit class that I'm going to write, so I'm going to write implicit class, and I'm going to call this person like, which wraps a string. So it's a simple wrapper over a string. And I'm going to define a method called greet, which looks like the method from the person class. This will return a string. And this will be person with the name denoted by that string. And then I'm going to call greet on that. Now, if I define an implicit class like this, which wraps a single argument, because that's the rule with implicit classes, then I can write something like this. Let's call this Daniel's greet. As the string Daniel, my name, dot greet. And this code compiles just fine, even though the greet method does not really exist on the string class. And this is fine because the compiler replaces Daniel dot greet with new person like Daniel dot greet. So something like this. And this is what the compiler does behind the scenes. So with an implicit class, a string can automatically be wrapped into one of these person-like instances if the code would not normally compile. All right. So this is what the compiler does behind the scenes. Now, libraries like cats do this all the time. So they grant external extension methods to existing types like lists, and numbers and options and so on and so forth by extending the methods that are specific to certain type classes. And that is a more complicated topic that we talk about in the CATS course. Now, in Scala 3, the implicit keyword is being deprecated, although it's fully supported in Scala 3.0. And in Scala 3.1 and onward, the implicit keyword will start to be deprecated and eventually removed. Now, the mechanisms that the implicit keyword will be replaced with um, consist of the given and using clauses, which I have a bunch of videos here on the Rock the JVM channel, implicit conversions, which is also discussed in one of those videos, and the so-called extension methods first class structure in Scala 3, which is the goal of this video. So how are extension methods declared? 
So I'm going to comment this implicit class. So I'm going to comment this one. I'm going to move Daniel's greet below the extension methods section over here. And notice that my code turned red because the greet method really doesn't exist on the string class. Now, for our scenario where the string taking an extra method greet, which is person like, we can write an explicit extension clause. And this looks like this extension and then a space, and then inside parentheses, I'm going to say which kind of value I want to extend a method with. So I'm going to say string of type string. So whenever I find a string, I can decorate it, I can attach the external method that I'm going to define as follows. I'm going to define greet, which returns a string, and I'm going to say person with a name denoted by that string dot greet. And notice that once I've defined this method greet as an extension, the code now compiles. So this is how we can grant existing types new methods like this. And just to prove that this code works, I'm going to define a main method and I'm going to print line Daniel's greet. So I'm going to run this application. I'm going to see, hi, my name is Daniel. Nice to meet you. All right. So notice that we can extend a string type with some external method. All right. Now, much like implicit classes that we write in Scala 2, these extension methods can also be generic. So let's say somebody somewhere wrote a small library with a tree data structure that I'm going to define as follows. I'm going to define a sealed abstract class. I'm going to call this tree. And this takes a type argument A that denoting the value contained in the nodes of the tree and the, the tree abstract class can be represented as two case classes case class that I'm going to call leaf, which takes a type argument a I'm going to make it covariant, because containers should be covariant and I discussed that in one of the videos here on the channel. So I'm going to create a case class leaf that wraps a value of type a, and this extends tree a and I'm going to define another case class that I'm going to call branch. This also takes the type argument A, and this takes two other trees, left, which is a tree A, and a right, which is a tree A. And this also extends tree A. Cool. So let's assume somebody somewhere wrote this in a library. In other words, we don't really have access to the source code of the tree data structure so that we can add additional methods. On the other hand, we want to add some methods that we normally use on other collections like lists. For example, I would like to add a filter method, which uh, says whether this tree only contains values uh, satisfying a predicate. So that would be nice. So here's how we could write that. So in order to make a, an extension method to the tree data structure, we would have to write a generic extension. And here's how that would look like. So I'm going to say extension, and I'm going to add a type argument a, and I'm going to wrap a tree as a tree of a. So this signature over here signifies the kind of values that we have access to. So we have a generic type argument a, so the type argument a is known once the method is being invoked and the tree which we are wrapping. So I'm going to define a method called filter, which takes a predicate as a function a to boolean. And this will return a boolean. And just for the sake of completion, I'm going to also implement this method, I'm going to say tree match. And in case we have a leaf with a value, then I'm going to run that predicate on that value. So I'm going to say predicate apply to the value. And otherwise, I'm going to have a branch with a left and right subtree. And then I'm going to say left filter predicate, or actually and right filter predicate. All right, so notice that we already have access to the filter as an extension method on the left and right members, because left and right are both trees. So if I have, for example, let's call this simple tree as a tree of int, I'm going to define a branch with leaf one and leaf two, just to make this super simple. And I'm going to print line whether all the numbers in this tree are 
bigger than zero, for example. So I'm going to say tree dot filter, and I'm going to say underscore bigger than zero. And underscore bigger than zero is a small lambda that says whether an argument is bigger than zero. And this should print true because both values are bigger than zero. All right, so first of all, notice that the code compiles at all because we added this extension method, which is generic. So it can apply to a tree of int, to a tree of string, to a tree of whatever. All right. Now, an even better feature is that the method itself, which is extension method, can also be generic. So you can add type arguments here in the extension clause and or in the method definition. So for example, if I wanted to decorate this tree data structure with a map function, I could add another extension. And I'm going to add the type argument a with a tree that I want to decorate. So I'm going to have tree a, and I'm going to define a method called map, which takes the type argument b and a function from a to b, and this will return a tree of b. And just to make things simple, I'm going to do a pattern match, so tree match. And in case I get a leaf with a value, then I'm going to obtain another leaf with the value obtained by applying f to this thing. So I'm going to say f value. And in case I get a branch with left and right, then I'm going to say new branch with left map f and right map f. All right. So in my case, if I want to, for example, if I want to multiply every number in this tree by 10, I can say print line tree map underscore multiplied by 10. And I would obtain a branch with leaf 10 and leaf 20. Let's see how that runs. All right, so we get a branch with leaf 10 and leaf 20. That's because the map method can automatically apply to this tree. All right. So notice that we can add type arguments both in the extension clause and in the method definition. This is really cool. Now, by the way, you can group both of these, both these extensions, without needing to specify the extension clause every time. So for example, I can wrap both the filter and the map in the same extension zone. So I can delete this extension and I can open a curly brace and I can wrap both these inside the same extension zone. So this will work just as fine. So if I run this application, first of all, it will compile and then it will produce the same result. All right. Now, the last thing that I want to talk about in this video is how extension methods can work in the presence of using clauses. So let's see how we can attach a new method sum to our new binary tree data structure. If our argument is numeric, in other words, if we have a given numeric a in scope, so I'm going to have an extension with tree a in the presence of a numeric given. So I'm going to have another extension. I'm going to have a type argument a and this can wrap a tree as tree a in the presence of a using clause. So I'm going to say using numeric as a numeric a. Numeric a is a type that has some methods defined for numerical types like int, float, double, and so on and so forth. And we can use an instance of numeric to apply mathematical operators regardless of what the type a was. So I'm going to have a method called sum, which returns a single value of type A, assuming that A is numeric. Now, I'm going to run a pattern match here. So I'm going to say tree match. And in case we get a leaf with a value, then I'm going to return that particular value. And in case I'm going to have a branch with a left and a right, then I'm going to use the API from the numeric type. So I'm going to say numeric dot plus with left dot sum and right dot sum. And the sum method is now applicable to my tree of int. So I can say print line. And I'm going to say tree dot sum because sum is applicable to all trees for which there is a numeric of type int in scope. And the Scala standard library already has some given numeric of the regular types 
already imported in scope. So I'm going to run this application and first you're gonna see that the application compiles and then the sum method applies correctly to this tree yielding the result three. All right, so this is how we can add an extension method using a using clause. Now you can move this using clause to either the extension clause or the definition of the method, the signature of the method. And this will work just as fine. So if I run this application, I'm going to see the same result. Now you can add using clauses to both the extension clause and the method definition, or even you can add both. So assuming that I'm interested, for example, in an ordering, so I'm going to have in uh, using ordering as ordering A for whatever reason, for example, if you want to do the uh, difference operator where the ordering matters, you can add a using clause both in the extension part or in the method definition part. Now this combination of extension methods in the presence of implicit or given instances of various types give rise to very powerful patterns including type classes and DSLs and libraries like cats or cats effect and so on and so forth which yield some really powerful results. So in this video, we've deconstructed the mechanism of extension methods in Scala 3. I hope it was useful. And if you like this video, go ahead and click the like button for me and subscribe to the channel for more videos like this. And check out the Rock the JVM channel and follow me on Twitter and LinkedIn for fresh updates on upcoming material. Now, as always, I'm dying for feedback, so please leave me yours in the comments. I read every single one. And check out the Rock the JVM website. I have tons of material about Scala and functional programming and cats and Aka and Apache Spark and so much more. Until next time, I'm Daniel, signing off.